on the decay of the art of lying this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org read by bob newfeld on the decay of the art of lying by mark twain essay for discussion read at a meeting of the historical and antiquarian club of hartford and offered for the thirty-dollar prize note did not take the prize observe i do not mean to suggest that the custom of lying has suffered any decay or interruption no for the lie as a virtue a principle is eternal the lie as a recreation a solace a refuge in time of need the fourth grace the tenth muse man's best and surest friend is immortal and cannot perish from the earth while this club remains my complaint simply concerns the decay of the art of lying no high-minded man no man of right feeling can contemplate the lumbering and slovenly lying of the present day without grieving to see a noble art so prostituted in this veteran presence i naturally enter upon this theme with diffidence it is like an old maid trying to teach nursery matters to the mothers in israel it would not become me to criticize you gentlemen who are nearly all my elders and my superiors in this thing if i should here and there seem to do it i trust it will in most cases be more in a spirit of admiration than fault-finding indeed if this finest of the fine arts had everywhere received the attention the encouragement and conscientious practice and development which this club has devoted to it i should not need to utter this lament or shed a single tear i do not say this to flatter i say it in a spirit of just and appreciative recognition it had been my intention at this point to mention names and to give illustrative specimens but indications observable about me admonished me to beware of the particulars and confine myself to generalities no fact is more firmly established than that lying is a necessity of our circumstances the deduction that it is then a virtue goes without saying no virtue can reach its highest usefulness without careful and diligent cultivation therefore it goes without saying that this one ought to be taught in the public schools even in the newspapers what chance has the ignorant uncultivated liar against the educated expert what chance have i against mr per uh, against a lawyer judicious lying is what the world needs i sometimes think it were even better and safer not to lie at all than to lie injudiciously an awkward unscientific lie is often as ineffectual as the truth now let us see what the philosophers say note that venerable proverb children and fools always speak the truth the deduction is plain adults and wise persons never speak it parkman the historian says the principle of truth may itself be carried into an absurdity in another place in the same chapters he says the saying is old that truth shall not be spoken at all times and those whom a sick conscience worries into habitual violation of the maxim are imbeciles and nuisances it is strong language but true none of us could live with an habitual truth-teller but thank goodness none of us has to an habitual truth-teller is simply an impossible creature it does not exist it never has existed of course there are people who think they never lie but it is not so and this ignorance is one of the very things that shame our so-called civilization everybody lies every day every hour awake asleep in his dreams in his joy in his mourning if he keeps his tongue still his hands his feet his eyes his attitude will convey deception and purposely even in sermons but that is a platitude 
in a far country where i once lived the ladies used to go around paying calls under the humane and kindly pretence of wanting to see each other and when they returned home they would cry out with a glad voice saying we made sixteen calls and found fourteen of them out not meaning that they had found out anything important against the fourteen no that was only a colloquial phrase to signify that they were not at home and their manner of saying it expressed their lively satisfaction in the fact now their pretence of wanting to see the fourteen and the other two whom they had been less lucky with was that commonest and mildest form of lying which is sufficiently described as a deflection from the truth is it justifiable most certainly it is beautiful it is noble for its object is not to reap profit but to convey a pleasure to the sixteen the iron-souled truth-monger would plainly manifest or even utter the fact that he didn't want to see those people and he would be an ass and inflict totally unnecessary pain and next those ladies in that far country but never mind they had a thousand pleasant ways of lying that grew out of gentle impulses and were a credit to their intelligence and an honour to their hearts let the particulars go the men in that far country were liars every one their mere howdy-do was a lie because they didn't care how you did except they were undertakers to the ordinary inquirer you lied in return for you made no conscientious diagnostic of your case but answered at random and usually missed it considerably he lied to the undertaker and said your health was failing a wholly commendable lie since it cost you nothing and pleased the other man if a stranger called and interrupted you you said with your haughty tongue i'm glad to see you and said with your haughtier soul i wish you were with the cannibals and it was dinner-time when he went you said regretfully must you go and followed it with a call again but you did no harm for you did not deceive anybody nor inflict any hurt, whereas the truth would have made you both unhappy. I think that all this courteous lying is a sweet and loving art, and should be cultivated. The highest perfection of politeness is only a beautiful edifice, built, from the base to the dome, of graceful and gilded forms of charitable and unselfish lying what i bemoan is the growing prevalence of the brutal truth let us do what we can to eradicate it an injurious truth has no merit over an injurious lie neither should ever be uttered the, the man who speaks an injurious truth lest his soul be not saved if he do otherwise should reflect that that sort of a soul is not strictly worth saving the man who tells a lie to help a poor devil out of trouble is one of whom the angels doubtless say lo here is an heroic soul who casts his own welfare in jeopardy to succour his neighbours let us exalt this magnanimous liar an injurious lie is an uncommendable thing and so also and in the same degree is an injurious truth a fact that is recognised by the law of libel among other common lies we have the silent lie the deception which one conveys by simply keeping still and concealing the truth many obstinate truth-mongers indulge in this dissipation imagining that if they speak no lie they lie not at all in that far country where i once lived there was a lovely spirit a lady whose impulses were always high and pure and whose character answered to them one day i was there at dinner and remarked in a general way that we are all liars she was amazed and said not all it was before pinafore's time so i did not make the response which would naturally follow in one day but frankly said yes all we are all liars there are no exceptions she looked almost offended why do you include me certainly i said 
I think you even rank as an expert. She said, Shh, the children. So the subject was changed in deference to the children's presence, and we went on talking about other things. But as soon as the young people were out of the way, the lady came warmly back to the matter and said, I have made a rule of my life to never tell a lie and I have never departed from it in a single instance. I said, I don't mean the least harm or disrespect, but really you have been lying like smoke ever since I've been sitting here. It has caused me a good deal of pain, because I'm not used to it. She required of me an instance, just a single instance. So I said, here is the unfilled duplicate of the blank which the Oakland Hospital people sent to you by the hand of the sick nurse when she came here to nurse your little nephew through his dangerous illness. This blank asks all manners of questions as to the conduct of that sick nurse. Did she ever sleep on her watch? Did she ever forget to give the medicine? And so forth and so on. You are warned to be very careful and explicit in your answers for the welfare of the service requires that the nurses be promptly fined or otherwise punished for derelictions. You told me that you were perfectly delighted with this nurse, that she had a thousand perfections and only one fault. You found you could never depend on her wrapping Johnny up half sufficiently, while he waited in a chilly chair for her to rearrange the warm bed. You filled up the duplicate of this paper and sent it back to the hospital by the hand of the nurse. How did you answer this question? Was the nurse at any time guilty of a negligence which was likely to result in the patient's taking cold? Come, everything is decided by a bet here in California. Ten dollars to ten cents you lied when you answered that question. She said, I didn't. I left it blank. Just so. You have told a silent lie. You have left it to be inferred that you had no fault to find in that matter. She said, Oh, was that a lie? And how could I mention her one single fault, and she is so good? It would have been cruel. I said, One ought always to lie when one can do good by it. Your impulse was right, but your judgment was crude. This comes of unintelligent practice. Now, observe the results of this inexpert deflection of ours. You know Mr. Jones's Willie is lying very low with scarlet fever. Well, your recommendation was so enthusiastic that that girl is there nursing him and the worn-out family have all been trustingly sound asleep for the last fourteen hours, leaving their darling with full confidence in those fatal hands, because you, like young George Washington, have a reputation. <clears throat> However, if you are not going to have anything to do, I will come around to-morrow, and we'll attend the funeral together, for, of course, you'll naturally feel a peculiar interest in Willie's case as personal a one, in fact, as the undertaker. Before I was half-way through, she was in a carriage, and making thirty miles an hour toward the Jones mansion to save what was left of Willie, and to tell all she knew about the deadly nurse. All of which was unnecessary, as Willie wasn't sick. I had been lying myself. But that same day, all the same, she sent a line to the hospital, which filled up the neglected blank, and stated the facts, too, in the squarest possible manner. Now, you see, this lady's fault was not in lying, but in lying injudiciously. She should have told the truth there, and made it up to the nurse with a fraudulent compliment further along in the paper. She could have said, In one respect this sick nurse is perfection. When she is on the watch, she never snores. Almost any little pleasant lie would have taken the sting out of that troublesome but necessary expression of the truth. Lying is universal. We all do it. Therefore, the wise thing is for diligently to train ourselves to lie thoughtfully, judiciously, 
to lie with a good object and not an evil one to lie for others advantage and not our own to lie healingly charitably humanely not cruelly hurtfully maliciously to lie gracefully and graciously not awkwardly and clumsily to lie firmly frankly squarely with head erect not haltingly tortuously with pusillanimous mien as being ashamed of our high calling then shall we be rid of the rank and pestilent truth that is rotting the land then shall we be great and good and beautiful and worthy dwellings in the world where even benign nature habitually lies except when she promises execrable weather then but am i but a new and feeble student in this gracious art i cannot instruct this club joking aside i think there is much need of wise examination into what sorts of lies are best and wholesomest to be indulged seeing we must all lie and we do all lie and what sorts it may be best to avoid and this is the thing which i feel i can confidently put into the hands of this experienced club a ripe body who may be termed in this regard and without undue flattery old masters and of on the decay of the art of lying by mark twain